Hello and welcome to the Race and Rights Podcast. This is Sahar Aziz, Distinguished Law Professor at Rutgers Law School, author of The Racial Muslim When Racism Quashes Religious Freedom, and director of the Rutgers Center for Security, Race, and Rights, also known as CSRR. You can learn more about the center by visiting our website at csrr.rutgers.edu or following us on Instagram at Rutgers CSRR or on Twitter and Facebook at RUCSRR. The Race and Rights podcast explores the myriad issues that adversely impact the civil and human rights of America's diverse Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities, here as well as abroad. Today's podcast is entitled Consistent Partiality, U.S. Foreign Policy on Palestine-Israel, featuring international human rights lawyer Sarah Lee Whitson and Professor Peter Beinart. Our guests examine the Biden administration's professed support for democracy and human rights all the while maintaining unconditional U.S. support for Israel, which human rights organizations have found is an apartheid state. Ms. Whitson and Professor Beinart also explore the political and ideological foundations of America's hostility to Palestinian freedom and ask questions such as, what would it take to change those foundations? And does the U.S. establishment's unconditional support for Israel actually serve America's national interests? Let's hear what our guests have to say about these important questions affecting U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. Now, Peter Beinart is professor of journalism and political science at Newmark School of Journalism at the City University of New York. Shout out to CUNY, another law school that's very social justice oriented and also the entire university. Professor Beinart is the author of the book, The Crisis of Zionism. He's also editor at large of Jewish Currents. He's an MSNBC political commentator, a frequent contributor to the New York Times, and a non-resident fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace. He also writes the Beinart Notebook newsletter on Substack.com, so you should always check out his latest work. Our second panelist and guest is Sarah Lee Whitson, who is Executive Director of Democracy for the Arab World Now, also called DAWN. Previously, she served as Executive Director of Human Rights Watch's Middle East and North Africa Division from 2004 to 2020, overseeing the work of the division in 19 countries with staff located in 10 countries. Ms. Whitson has led dozens of advocacy and investigative missions throughout the region, focusing on issues of armed conflict, accountability, legal reform, migrant workers, and human rights. She's published widely on human rights and foreign policy in the Middle East in international and regional media, including the New York Times, Foreign Affairs, The Washington Post, Foreign Policy, The Los Angeles Times, and CNN. So with that, a warm welcome to our guests today. We're very honored to have you. Welcome, Peter, and welcome, Sarah. It's truly an honor to have you. I'm a big fan of both of your work, and so it's we're fortunate to have your expertise. So I thought I would start the conversation, and just for our audience, this is going to be more of a conversational format as opposed to presentations by both panelists. So I'd like to start the conversation by going to the heart of the issue, right, that tends to shut down any discussion on the human rights and humanity of Palestinians. And that is the allegation that any criticism of Israel is thinly veiled anti-Semitism. Indeed, this charge was boosted when the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, also called IHRA, included in its definition of anti-Semitism the example of calling Israel a racist state. Unfortunately, the definition has been weaponized by many special interest groups who have a very specific political agenda, which is to quash any discussion or academic freedom on university campuses about Palestine, in particular about the perspective of Palestinians and the human rights violations they're experiencing, and ultimately to blacklist university students that is frankly reminiscent of the McCarthyist era. So can you both explain what is going on? Is this merely ideological warfare or is there merit to this expansive definition of anti-Semitism? And more importantly for our topic today, how is it affecting U.S. foreign policy on Palestine? So Peter, I wanted to start with you and then then we'll move to Sarah. Sure. To be fair, I don't think most defenders of Israel or most people who support the IHRA definition would say that any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. What they would say is that opposing the existence of Israel as a Jewish state is anti-Semitic. I think to understand why this has become so important, 
one has to understand that the paradigm that we've been living in since the 1990s, which was the paradigm of the two-state solution, in which Israel would leave the territories that it conquered in 1967, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip, these places where it controls the lives of millions of Palestinians who live under Israeli control but can't become citizens, can't vote for the Israeli government that controls their lives, live in West Bank under military law and in Gaza under blockade, which violates really basic notions of human rights. The idea is we're going to solve this problem by giving the Palestinians citizenship in their own state and Israel will remain as a Jewish state. But what's happened since the 1990s, in large measure because Israel has subsidized all of this settlement growth in the West Bank, the notion of an independent, sovereign, viable Palestinian state has become more and more impossible to imagine, right? So if you think about it, if you believe that Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem deserve to be citizens of, the, of a country, right, the country in which they live, and you're not going to give them their own country, then naturally people who believe in things like human rights will say, well, they should be citizens of Israel or this territory that they already live in, right? But of course, if they're citizens, then in fact, Israel would not be a Jewish state, certainly in the way it is now, right? It would not have, right now it's a Jewish state because most of the Palestinians under its can't control can't vote. If they can vote, then they would naturally change the definition of the state to be one that reflects their own identity, a state that treats everyone with equality under the law, irrespective of your race or religion or sex. And that, and it's precisely because the death of the two-state solution leads people who believe in human rights naturally towards that conclusion that the response has been from the Israeli government and allies around the world to say, no, 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 you can't take that position because taking the position that Israel should, that this territory should be a treat place which gives everyone citizenship and treats them equally under the law is bigotry, right? Just think about how Orwellian that is, right? To say you support equality under the law and citizenship for all is anti-Semitic. What position is not bigoted? To support a status quo in which millions of people are denied the most basic rights because they have the misfortune of being Palestinian and not Jewish, right? So the whole thing really is in a crazy kind of double speak, but it is essentially, I think, a desire to impede the natural movement towards saying there is something wrong in the self-definition of a Jewish state if Jewish statehood means that you have millions of people who cannot be citizens and cannot vote in the country in which they live. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I guess I would, that the weaponization of the label anti-Semitic has been used for many, many decades, probably even before the IHRA definition came to try to legalize it in a sense. And I'll explain what I mean by that to deflect from criticism of the state of Israel and the Israeli government and its uh, systematic and widespread human rights abuses of Palestinians, as well as war crimes in the occupied Palestinian territories. For as long as I've been working on Israel-Palestine, the number one defense of people whose only interest is to defend Israel and the Israeli government from criticism has been to attack the facts by labeling the speakers as anti-Semitic, to never address the facts of mass home demolitions, theft of land, mass executions of civilians, apartheid, uh, by just saying, well, the speaker is anti-Semitic. So it's a tired tactic. What's dangerous about this now is that the IHRA definition is seeking a form of quasi-legal status because the advocates of that definition are seeking to have state agencies, federal agencies, recognize that as a working definition, which means that for someone who says that everybody living under Israeli sovereignty should have equal rights, that is de facto anti-Semitic because in some people's minds that undermines the status of Israel as a Jewish state. I don't think it needs to, and I wouldn't concede that it does. But then therefore, those people should be sanctioned and punished deprived of federal funding, deprived of state funding. And we already seeing versions of that. For example, most recently, Morningstar, one of the biggest rating agencies and publications, rating companies, acquired a small company that rates companies according to a human rights metric. And because that human rights metric includes rating Israel for its human rights abuses, and therefore ranking it quite low, 
Morningstar was attacked as anti-Semitic. And I believe 13, if not 17, attorney generals of several states threatened to terminate business with Morningstar because merely ranking Israel for its human rights abuses and advising companies that their business in Israel would contribute to those abuses was deemed anti-Semitic. And so Morningstar had to literally dump the company it had acquired and dump all human rights ratings by this company because any ranking or rating of Israel's human rights record was being labeled by state attorney generals as anti-Semitic. I think this is a very, very dangerous intrusion on our free speech and our free speech right, our willingness and desire to associate with whomever we want. And, you know, is really just a long line in a series of the Israeli governments and the Israeli government supporters' efforts to use law as a weapon, as a tool to silence those who want to criticize and believe Israel's human rights record is deserving of criticism, as, of course, I believe. Thank you, Sarah. And I just want to add, you know, one of the challenges when you're dealing with trying, on the one hand, to protect the rights and the dignity of minorities, but also ensure that you live in a society where we can have critical debate and we can disagree, obviously, in a civil manner and respectfully, is that you have to be careful, and you alluded to this, Sarah, that if you use terminology that isn't accurate, then you actually decrease or erode the power, right, of those civil rights efforts. So I'll give you an example. It was a a years back during the peak of the global war on terror when things were, I think, at their worst in the U.S., there was a group of people within the Muslim civil rights circles, which is the, the circles that I was in before I became an academic, who wanted to define Islamophobia so broad that it was effectively going to include criticism of Saudi Arabia. And anything that criticized Saudi Arabian practices that somehow could be used. And there were certainly, I think, I was suspicious, and many of us were suspicious, that there was some lobbying going on behind the scenes by the Saudi regime. But I remember this internal debate within Muslim communities. And some people were like, yes, let's do this because this will take a hard approach and we'll make sure to make it you know, zero tolerance for anti-Muslim racism and Islamophobia. But others were saying, whoa, 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 whoa. We have to differentiate. And if we overuse it and inaccurately, people will no longer believe us when Islamophobia is really happening. So I guess this kind of leads me to, to ask Peter a question that is twofold. One is, So when we're talking about Israel's human rights record, which has been in the news for quite a while, for the last year, I would say at least, in ways that's unusual in the United States anyway, the report by Human Rights Watch, UN officials have stated that Israel is an apartheid state, Human Rights Watch has concluded that, other human rights organizations. And so before I ask Sarah kind of the legal explanation of whether there is actually, is this an accurate conclusion based on the law and the facts? I'm interested, Peter, in both your analysis on that, but also what are the conversations that are being had within the diverse Jewish communities within the United States with regard to kind of this label of apartheid state or this broader, you know, what the definition of anti-Semitism and how that can actually be counterproductive for protecting against anti-Semitism? Right. American Jews are deeply divided on these questions. So there's a poll that came out a while back, which suggested that about 25 percent of American Jews themselves endorse the idea that Israel is an apartheid state. And what's remarkable about that, right, is essentially, according to American Jewish, the most powerful American Jewish organizations, that position is an anti-Semitic position. Right. So you're essentially saying that a very large number of American Jews and a particularly large number of younger American Jews, right, are anti-Semites or or participating in anti-Semitism, which is, it's a kind of a bizarre position to take, right? These are in many cases your own children and grandchildren, right? So I think that what we see is that actually out there in the country, there's a wide and I would say growing cleavage among American Jews along two axes. The first is generational, Because younger American Jews, like younger Americans in general, are more sympathetic towards Palestinian rights. They've grown up with seeing right-wing Israeli governments that have no interest in ending Israel's occupation and are often aligned with right-wing forces in the United States. Whereas older American Jews are more likely to kind of see Israel as an imperiled and existentially threatened country. The other division you have is is over religion, right? So just as among white American Christians, 
you tend to find that those who are more religiously engaged are more politically conservative. You find that among American Jews as well. So you have a very clear kind of divide along these two axes. But what's important to understand is that certain groups of American Jews are much better represented in American Jewish organizational leadership than others, right? This is not unique to Jews, right? We know that many Cuban Americans, for instance, don't think that a blockade on Cuba is a good idea, but they tend to not be the the people who lead Cuban American organizations. So if you look at the American Jewish organizations that have the most influence in Washington, they tend to represent older, wealthier, and more religious American Jews who tend to take the position that their role should be to defend Israel against virtually all criticism and to ensure that American support is maintained unconditionally. And one of the consequences of this is a really deep and often profound alienation that you find among younger American Jews towards their own leadership and the institutions through which they grew up, whether it's their synagogues or their camps or their schools. And one of the things that worries me among my obviously deep concern about the impact of all of this for Palestinians is the impact of this on the future of American Jewish life. I'm someone who for cares a great deal about having a strong, vibrant, committed, educated Jewish community. And one of the things I see is that some kids are actually alienated from that. They won't even go to the Hillel on their own campus, which could be a resource for them to actually have a deepening understanding and appreciation and knowledge of Judaism because they're so morally alienated because they see those institutions as having sold out their ethical principles on the question of Israel. And that worries me for our own community. It's interesting. We have different fault lines within Muslim American younger generations and their relationship with mosques and with religious organizations. But that's but I appreciate you helping to de-essentialize the diverse Jewish American community. I think that's also part of the conversation that tends not to happen enough. So, Sarah, let's kind of take advantage of your extensive and deep legal expertise as a human rights advocate. As we know, It's very contentious, this conclusion that Human Rights Watch has made and some other organizations that Israel is an apartheid state. What is the factual basis that supports it? And I mean, I think a lot of us are familiar with the politics, but what is it that caused each Human Rights Watch and some of these other orgs to hit the tipping point to say, that's it, it's gone apartheid? Because as we know, those of us who kind of keep track of what's been going on in the West Bank and Gaza, a lot of these practices aren't new. Your rights to have these practices are not new, and Human Rights Watches, Amnesty Internationals, Harvard Law Schools, the UN Special Rapporteur for Israel and the Occupied Palestinian Territory, their legal reports may be new, but the situation of apartheid, the crimes of apartheid and persecution by Israel are not new. But I think you're right that there has reached a tipping point which led all of these organizations and institutions to finally prepare a legal analysis that looked at the decades of military occupation, the decades of laws inside Israel that privilege Jewish citizens of Israel over uh, non-Jewish citizens of Israel, particularly uh, Muslim Palestinians, to draw on that systematic pattern of many decades to reach a conclusion that this is indeed apartheid. I think there's a larger story to be told as to why these reports have been have issued in the past year and a half. But I think given that we do have a legal audience here that I know some people are seeking legal credit, I thought I would just spend a few minutes to explain the law of apartheid and persecution and how these organizations uh, came to conclude that Israel is committing the crimes of apartheid and persecution, which are two distinct crimes. In so doing, I am going to try to mush their reports together since the reports weren't identical. But in the broadest brush, I would say, first of all, in terms of the crime of apartheid, it is a part of international criminal law, which includes not just the 1973 International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, but also the 1998 Rome Statute to the International Criminal Court which both define apartheid as a crime against humanity, consisting of three elements. And it's important to note that these are broadly drafted elements that are not particular to any one geography or territory, even though the crime of apartheid has been associated with South Africa. The laws do not apply only to South Africa or the South African situation. Instead, they look at certain facts, certain elements. Those elements include, uh, most importantly, an intent by one racial group to dominate another, 
Second, systematic oppression by the dominant group over the marginalized group. And finally, particularly grave abuses uh, known as inhumane acts. So what the legal analysis of these various organizations, as well as Beth Salem, an is the leading Israeli human rights organization, and Al-Haq, a leading Palestinian organization, to name really just to emphasize that these are conclusions by local organizations, they're conclusions by international human rights organizations, they're conclusions by the leading law school, Harvard Law School, that has investigated this issue, and the conclusion of the United Nations through the UN Special Rapporteur's report. And what they found is that it is Israeli policy to maintain the domination by Jewish Israelis over Palestinians across Israel and the occupied territory. It is coupled, Human Rights Watch specifically found, in the occupied territory with systematic oppression and humane acts. Amnesty's report is broader because it went back to look at Israel's record since the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948 to find also systematic oppression and inhumane acts uh, against Palestinians within Israel proper, within the state that was established and declared in 1948. The facts are in the Palestinian territories, Israeli authorities methodologically, systematically privilege one of the groups, Jewish Israelis, who are governed under the same body of laws with the same rights and privileges, whether they live in occupied Palestinian territory or whether they live in Israel proper. They get one set of laws, a civil law that is actually quite protective of civil and political rights of Israeli Jews, as well as of quite protective of rights of Israelis charged with crimes. This is in contrast to the rights that are allocated to Palestinians, which are inferior, which are harsh, which are cruel, which are military laws against Palestinians. So they systematically discriminate against them wherever they live. Effectively, you have two sets of laws, a good set of laws, a friendly set of laws, a protective set of laws for Israeli Jews and a harmful set of laws, a discriminatory set of laws, a cruel set of laws. For example, that allow children to be detained preemptively, indefinitely, without charge, something that would never happen uh, to an Israeli Jewish child. The intent to dominate, how is this reflected across Israel and the occupied territory? The intent to privilege Jewish Israelis at the expense of Palestinians is done through ways that they openly describe as Palestinians being a demographic threat. And so passing laws that make the land available for Jewish communities while concentrating Palestinians in dense enclaves to segregate them from Jewish Israelis, to not allow them to grow and expand their communities, to deny them building permits, to confiscate their homes whenever possible and demolish them. It also includes efforts, for example, to Judaize uh, the Negev and Galilee regions of Israel in order for the declared public intent of maintaining a solid Jewish majority. Maintaining a solid Jewish majority doesn't just come with the carrots of inviting Jews from around the world to move to Israel and receive all kinds of economic benefits when they acquire Israeli citizenship, but to punish and deprive Palestinians and Arabs in that area in order to persuade them to move. And that is what we've seen. We've seen mass forced displacement of Palestinians to push them out uh, while they settle Jews in the land and encourage them and give them benefits to live there. The heart of the system is keeping Palestinians separated from each other as well into these distinct territorial legal domains. There are statements and actions by Israeli authorities that have clarified this intent to maintain domination, including the passage of the nation state law, which explicitly states that Israel is a nation state of the Jewish people and only the Jewish people, never mind the 20% non-Jewish people, the Palestinian Arabs and Christians who live there, as well as the growing body of laws that I mentioned privilege Israeli settlers in the occupied territory, but do not apply to Palestinians. We see the institutional Mm -hmm. discrimination that Palestinian citizens of Israel face, including that allow hundreds of Jewish towns to exclude them, and budgets that allocate very small resources to Palestinian schools, for example, as opposed to Israeli children. And we see the systematic oppression and inhumane acts, including the sweeping restrictions on movement, the 14-year closure of Gaza, the confiscation of more than a third of the land of the West Bank, and denial of residency rights of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians. 
the system of laws that keeps Palestinians forced to live in certain enclaves, not allowed to move, living under uh, military rule. And as I mentioned, the mass home demolitions, as well as the forcing of thousands of Palestinians out of their homes. The 200-page report that Amnesty International produced, the 200-plus page report that Human Rights Watch produced, that provides very deep, deep factual and legal analysis. But anyone who has carried out an actual factual legal investigation of the circumstances of Israeli policies have all reached the same conclusion. Israel is committing the crimes of apartheid and persecution against Palestinians living under their control. Can I just add to the just, Oh, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to make the point that these are not legal analysts, but it's worth noting, again, specifically because the claim that these conclusions are anti-Semitic, B'Tselem and Yeshdin, which are two of Israel's probably most prominent human rights organizations, but quite a number of quite prominent Israeli politicians themselves, from former Prime Minister Ehud Barak to former Prime Minister Ehud Omer, have said that Israel was on its way to apartheid. If there could be no Palestinian state, I'm Ayalon, the former head of Shin Bet, Aleph Bat Yehushua, who recently passed away, who was one of Israel's most prominent novelists. So there are many, many people who it seems to me who it would be absurd to suggest are anti-Semitic, who have also come to this conclusion because it's in Desmond Tutu, Cyril Ramaphosa, the head of the South African president, because when you actually look at the legal condition for Palestinians, it's actually difficult not to come to the conclusion that you have one group legally dominating and oppressing another. So this is actually a good segue into a follow-up question I had for you, Peter. I've read some of your work that carefully and thoughtfully distinguishes between political Zionism and cultural Zionism. And admittedly, I, I saw that and I thought, that looks a little suspect. I don't understand. Could you unpack that? And then how does this analysis that Sarah just gave and that you you also supplemented, what does that mean for Zionism? Have the right-wing Jews in Israel made a two-state solution impossible and made a one-state solution inevitable or in the alternative apartheid indefinite? Right. So the Zionist was a movement that wanted, you could say, two different things. Some Zionists focused on a Jewish state in Palestine, a state that would obviously focus on representing and privileging Jews over Palestinians. Cultural Zionists focused on the importance of a Jewish society in Israel-Palestine. So Theodor Herzl was the progenitor of political Zionism. A man who wrote under the name of Achad Ha'am was the progenitor of cultural Zionism. And what was important about this is that as you moved through the 1930s into the 1940s, certain important cultural Zionists like Martin Buber, Hannah Arendt, Albert Einstein, Judah Magnus, said, we believe in the importance of a Jewish society in this area that has revived the Hebrew language, that it is important for the Jewish people around the world that there be a thriving Jewish community, a society, but we don't believe in a state that privileges Jews over Palestinians. Many of these people at various points wanted a binational state that provided equality for both Palestinians and Jews. That's the tradition that speaks compellingly to me. It's not the tradition that won out. Of course, Israel did create a Jewish state in 1948 in a war that led to the expulsion of three quarters of a million of Palestinians. And so there are many, many people who, seeing that a Jewish state oppresses Palestinians, say, well, of course, say I'm an anti-Zionist. And I understand why the vast majority of Palestinians would take that view. But for me, the reason that I consider myself a cultural Zionist, as someone who believes in one equal state that provides equality under the law to everybody, irrespective of race, religion, and sex, but that I still call myself a cultural Zionist is it's a way for me of signaling that I believe very deeply in the importance of a thriving Jewish community, a thriving Jewish society that keeps Hebrew alive, that allows certain things to happen culturally that can only happen in what Jews call the land of Israel, a place that is deeply precious to us religiously and culturally. But I don't see that in conflict with the idea of absolute equality for Palestinians. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Race and Rights podcast. This podcast is hosted by the Center for Security, Race, and Rights, housed at Rutgers Law School, also known as the People's Electric Law School. CSRR engages in research, education, and advocacy on issues that adversely impact the civil and human rights 
of America's diverse Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities. We do so through an interfaith, cross-racial, and interdisciplinary approach. To hear additional episodes of the Race and Rights Podcast, check out our pages on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, and everywhere else podcasts are available. Now, for a deep dive on these issues, visit our website at csrr.rutgers.edu, where you can find policy reports, teach-ins, and news commentary by our over 130 faculty affiliates. To watch our over 80 academic and public policy lectures, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Rutgers Center for Security, Race, and Rights. And on social media, be sure to follow us on Instagram at Rutgers CSRR and on Twitter and Facebook at RUCSRR. Finally, you can financially support the Center for Security, Race, and Rights by going to our website at csrr.rutgers.edu and press the donate button. And please give generously. As always, be well and see you next time.